I'm Sarah Lloyd Fox. I work at Birkbeck, the University of London, and I've been doing a collaborative project with some colleagues from King's College London in um, uh, South University. And um, we have been interested in trying to start doing research with infants with both MRI, so magnetic resonance imaging, and near-infrared spectroscopy, which is another form uh, of neuroimaging technique, which is particularly good for infants. Um, the project is looking at how the social brain develops in the first few months of life. So we're looking at um, infants from around three months up to around seven months. Um, we put them in a study with the MRI first, and then they do another session with the uh, near-infrared spectroscopy, or near as we shorten it to, um, and we want to look at how the brain functions when it's responding to these different social cues um, in both the MRI and the NIRS. Um, so to do this study, um, there are several methodological issues um, in order to get it to work, and then there are kind of some ways in which we can get the stimuli to work for both studies. Um, so for the stimuli, what we're interested in um, investigating is how infants kind of first un interpret in their brain these um, voice kind of uh, noises that they hear. So um, before even speech, um, how uh, do we respond to things like laughter and crying and um, neutral sounds that our voice makes like yawning and coughing and sneezing. Um, so we are looking at that with the MRI with these infants and we're kind of um, separating those different components and also comparing as a control condition um, some environmental sounds like water dripping or toys rattling, so things that infants will be familiar with. Um, for this MRI part of the project, it is quite difficult though because we have to um, put these infants into a scanner where you have to keep very still, you, you can't have any motion at all, um, and they've got to attend to these things. So in order to do this with infants, we do it when they're asleep. Um, so there are quite a few challenges with this study, um, even to get them to the sleeping stage. So um, we work very closely with parents, um, the researchers and parents work on this together to try and find the right time for these babies to sleep when their naps usually are. We wait for them to fall naturally to sleep um, and then we put some protection over their ears which um, helps reduce the noise of the scanner because it can be very um, noisy in adults. We also have very, um, special infant friendly sequences of collect MRI collection um, which allows the, the noises to lower down and other kind of measures like that to dampen down this noise and then also over the top of this mini muff which goes right inside there's a headphone and that's what um, not only shields the um, noise but also what gives the noise to the infant that they're meant to be listening to so these stimuli that, that we're presenting. We, when we analyse this data, uh, what we've found to be really interesting is that we've associated um, this data with adult data in that there seems to be a temporal response in a kind of what they term in adults a voice sensitive region. Um, it's right lateralised which is um, similar to adults as well. Um, so that was really interesting to find. Um, and then when we look at the emotions we have some evidence as well that the uh, sad emotions, so the adult crying noises, um, activate much more than the positive emotions like the adult laughing um, and it also it, it activates in several regions of the brain that are um, to do with kind of emotion um, regulation or interpretation that we found in adults for example the insula and parts of the frontal cortex and again in the temporal cortex as well um, so uh, with this data the only caveat is that um, we can't really uh, compare it to the neutral sounds because we have a different kind of order in which we present everything. So we can only um, contrast the two um, emotions. But uh, perhaps one thing that um, could be uh, a reason for this result is that sad um, vocalizations is something that we hope infants are not familiar with. Um, adult kind of sad noises, not baby crying, but adult sounds. And perhaps this is a kind of familiar familiarity effect that when they've heard so much adult laughing that the response is lower than the, the kind of novel crying. Or perhaps the infants are sensitive to this kind of measure. Um, indeed, you know, it might be something that we're sensitive to um, very early in life, so it will be something to investigate further.
together. Um, and then alongside the MRI study, we did a second session where they were doing this near-infrared spectroscopy. But the way the technique works is you have um, sets of very small uh, red lights and detectors, and the red light is near-infrared light, which means that it can penetrate tissue um, for a, a, a few centimetres. And in infants, where you have very translucent layers of the skin and the skull and the um, underlying kind of CSF, that means the light can get into the cortex and we can measure brain activity. Now this is quite a superficial measure because the um, infants, uh, sorry, because we, we can't um, measure right the way inside because the light just won't reach there. So the light can only go a certain way and what we're measuring is the reflected light back up from that cortical region. Um, so obviously uh, once the light's scattered all around then you can't read it anymore. So you can just do this surface layer. But there are many things that we can measure in the cortex with this technique. Um, it's very infant friendly because it's silent, it's portable, it's relatively inexpensive compared to MRI so it's a technique we can use more often than MRI. Um, and the hat goes on in a matter of 30 seconds so you can get the study going very quickly and obviously very good for um, studying infants that are awake um, and wriggly and interested in their environment um, without losing your data. So for this study, we were presenting them with social stimuli. So we did the same um, voice stimuli and environmental sound stimuli. And then we also um, portrayed this over the top of a visual stimulus, which was um, a peekaboo and nursery rhymes, kind of um, these kind of things, ha lots of hand movements, eye movements and mouth movements. And um, with this stimuli, we know um, from previous research at Birkbeck that um, infants respond in... A, tem a posterior temporal region of their cortex and in frontal areas which are the same as in adults to these kind of social dynamic um, kind of biological motion cues basically. Um, so we wanted to replicate that finding and then we could see where this social region was to then look at the auditory responses. Um, and in the, near, in the near study we nicely replicated this previous finding um, and then with the voice contrast we were contrasting just um, voice compared with environmental sounds um, and when we did that we had um, very widespread activation bilaterally so in both hemispheres um, to both the voice and the non-voice stimuli so there seems to be some difference um, when you look at this with the contrast between the MRI findings and the NIRS findings. So in the MRI you have a very right lateralized temporal response and not much happening in the left, but in the NIRS we had um, robust responses in both hemispheres. Um, and in fact when we compare the voice to the non-voice as we did in the MRI, we tended to find more activation in the left instead of the right. So these are very preliminary findings and what we think might be happening is that you have lots of individual differences. So now we're going to look at this data by comparing um, individual effects in the fMRI data, in the NIRS data and then also in the anatomy that we have, so the myelination um, scans that we have, um, so that we can see how these relate and whether they um, change um, with different infants and perhaps this can explain these, this ambiguity. Um, so this study is ongoing. We've now extended it to a study called the BASIS Project, which is British Autism Study of Infant Siblings. Um, and this is a study where we um, look at infants who have siblings with autism and we look for kind of... Um, correlates early on that may then help us see which infants go on to develop autism. Um, and with this project, uh, we're working very closely with um, Mark Johnson is the director at Birkbeck that is responsible for that side of the research and Professor Declan Murphy is at King's College London at the Institute of Psychiatry and so we're both working on this together for the next year to see if we can see whether it changes when um, infants may go on to develop autism because we know it differs in adults.